now, here's Ed Bernstein. Organized crime swept the nation during Prohibition. It was a time when mobsters and crooks would mingle at their local speakeasy, the secret playground for gangsters and felons. But there's one man, only one man, that dares enter this seedy underworld. He will risk it all for today's interview. Let's visit Ed Bernstein at the Mob Museum. Hey, welcome to our show. You'll never guess where I am. I'm in a secret room. Nobody knows about this room at the Mob Museum with a former undercover officer. Giovanni Rocco, Rocco, I should say. I already see. see I asked him. I asked the man how to pronounce his name. <laughs> That's he's, all right. he's, he's already uh, got me. Uh, I'll go with it. Going with a different name, right? No, we're we're good. Rocco, <laughs> Rocco. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, Giovanni. That's okay. But you have a very interesting background. Starting out, uh, let me you talk about your, your background. You grew up in Bayonne, uh, New Jersey. I did, right? That kind of city, you either become a cop or a criminal, right? Well, yeah, a little in between. It's a blue-collar city right outside of Manhattan, um, Jersey City. You know, that waterfront-esque town where you know, right. the mob, over when I grew up there, the mob controlled everything on the docks, uh, just like, you know, the old Marlon Brando on, on the waterfront. Right, yeah. What is it? And, uh, you know, my, my guys growing up, I grew up around Chuck Webner, who was the inspiration for Rocky. So that's the life I lived as a kid. And uh, so, yeah, you either became a police officer, a fireman, or uh, if you went the other way, you became a gangster or just stayed a blue collar and I don't know, the self-made businessman. But you have a family, you, I mean, your family history is really netted in, in police work, right? It you, is, yeah. And your I was father, your grandfather, or yeah. police officers. Yeah. So were you always like, you know, had this focus about becoming a police officer growing up? No, no, just the opposite. Uh, growing up, I was a problem child. I was terrible in school. You know, um, I was gravitated. My relationship with my father uh, when I was younger was a little ru rugged or rough. Um, so because of that, I was defiant to anything related to authority. Now, when you grow up in a, in a household where your dad's a police officer, is, I mean, does is, is that take a lot of his time and ability? I mean, is he away from home most of the time? or I mean, you hear about that about cops often. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we grew up, uh, we weren't a well-off family by any uh -huh. means, but my mom and dad struggled to give us what they did and provide a good life for us. And uh, he struggled. You know, he struggled working two jobs or whatever. It took working overtime details. And, you know, later in, in the years that passed, he always acknowledged I was never there. You know, I tried to be there as much as I could for you guys. And that kind of weighed on him a little bit. But he was there for a lot. You know, he coached our football teams and he raised us right. He, he raised the three right. of us, my sister and my brother. But he raised my brother and I to be hard, and he raised us to be men. So right. what he thought back then, he didn't have a, a father himself. He passed away at a young age. And um, because of that, my father just, you know, he, he raised us hard. So and that came out. So sometime there after you, you got the urge to become a police officer, I right? did, yeah. Right. I can remember the, I wrote in the book in one of the yeah. chapters the exact time I did. I decided on a car ride home. I watched my dad make a collar, you know, with the family in the car. He <laughs> saw a guy that was doing some yeah. stick-ups and armed robberies that was wanted, a violent felon. And, he, you know, he, he went and pulled over a patrol car. And, uh, you know, I, I was able to w make him watch the arrest. And it was moments like that. That's when I knew the switch was, uh -huh. this is what I'm going to do. Yeah, that it kind of like, hey, I want to be a superhero. Is that the way yeah, you look at yeah, it? I yeah, I want to be a good guy. Yeah. You know, cops and robbers, I always, playing as a kid, cops and robbers, good versus evil, I was always the good. Mm -hmm. You know, I always fought to be that guy. So you entered in, firstly into the police uh, police academy? Yeah, I finally got into the academy um, with a little help, you know, a, a little uh, Jersey manipulation. You, you neighborhood help. Yeah, right? yeah, a little neighborhood help never, never hurt. Right. And uh, I got the spot. I was fortunate to make it through the academy, and then I made it into the street and patrol and worked a few months there. And then uh, early in my career, I was given the opportunity to work uh, an undercover gig. And how did that work? I mean, somebody approaches you, hey, are you interested in doing undercover? They saw something in you that, that sparked some, you know, an interest? Yeah, the chief of the police department I was working for, he knew my background. He was friendly with my father and knew him over the years. And I just had a reputation, and I guess because of the way he watched me grow up and knew the kind of kid I was, um, the aggressiveness that I had as a, as a patrolman. You know, I, want, I loved working patrol, but I wanted to do, I knew in my heart I wanted to do narcotics. But my father advised me, don't do that, you know. He was working plain clothes, and he kind of wanted me to be a, a major case detective, you know, follow his path that he right. did in his department. But I knew I wanted to be a street cop. Why? 
it's that good versus evil. You know, I, I'm always, it's the adrenaline for me. You know, that's what it was early in my career. It was the thrill of the hunt, the chase. It was always, when I worked street narcotics, it was always pursuits at night and always crazy stuff going on where I worked. So. What, what was it about narcotics that I wanted you to get involved in that instead of getting into just being a, like your dad? Had well, the way I came up in the street, the way I, I saw, I think. Um, you saw a lot of dealing. Yeah, a lot of deals. Yeah. A lot of, of my friends had gone that way and, and gone that, down that dark path of using drugs. And it would, that's what I fought against. You know, I was in fourth grade when I saw the, one of my first friends, you know, she was getting a needle put in her arm. And then it was offered to me the next, you know, of course, I turned it away. But that's the things that inspired me to, to fight that good fight. And this was in Jersey. Yeah, in Jersey. Because around this period of time, New York had passed, uh, New York State had passed that Rockefeller law. Right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Where they kind of like, you know, you get convicted of a drug offense, you're going to prison. Yeah. No, and we, that was a tough law. Oh, yeah. We put a lot of guys, I mean, you know, um, a lot of guys in prison for narcotics offenses, and it was a heavy hit. I mean, I came on in 90, so the middle, you know, the height of the crack era and all that stuff was going on. So, and the closeness, the proximity to New York was just tremendous amounts of work. So in order to go undercover and doing narcotics, you know, eventually you go into dealing with the mob, but do, just doing narcotics, um, what kind of background do you need? I mean, they, 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 what do they teach you about drugs, narcotics? Uh, you know, how do how, you know how do you how do you act like you know a drug user? Yeah, I think nowadays drug? it's changed. Back then, yeah. it was if you had it, you had it. If you looked like you had it, and you looked like you could do it. If right. you were female and you had certain you know attributes, then. You got in that way. If you spoke a certain language and you were Hispanic or you had some kind of dialect, right. Colombian Colombians were big back then. You know, so if you had a Colombian or a Cuban dialect, then you might get chosen right. for that. Um, me, I was a skinny white kid that can grow my hair out and look like a heroin addict at the time when I was mm -hmm. younger. And uh, I got the scraggly beard and the hair and it just matched, you know. And because I was doing good work, the chief had asked me early on when I was still in patrol, he asked me to do a gig and I did it. And uh, a little cocky when I said he called me into his office. Actually, he yelled at me for riding a '77 Harley into my my PD. Well, it's character, right? Oh, yeah. well, no. At then, back then, I wasn't working on the cover. Right, okay, yeah. I was in patrol, and I yeah. came. I showed up with my blue uniform pants on and a white T-shirt, a leather vest, and uh, you know, my nine wasn't even in my holster. It was in my stuck in my pants, like a you know, like an outlaw biker type right. of guy. And he went up one side and down the other. Three weeks later, after screaming at me to get rid of the bike, he called me in and said, uh. You know, do you still have the bike? And I thought I was going to be fired right there. Mm -hmm. And then he said, look, I want to give you a shot. We got this gig. And I offered to do it. And he, he sold it to me. It was uh, guns and drugs. And I was like, yeah, no problem. Cocky. Were, 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 yeah, were you concerned about the, you know, um, about the risk involved in that type of job? I was, but I guess what I saw growing up in the street, I didn't mind. What my dad brought home for us, he, he made us a little callous. He used to bring uh, autopsy photos home. You know, pictures of floaters or pictures of homicides or whatever they were. And I saw these crime scene photos that he right. would bring. You know, it was, I think he did it not to abuse us. He did it to harden us, to make us right. fear yeah. the streets. Yeah. Stay out of the streets and stay away from this or this can wind up, you know, you can wind up like this. So I, I had all those images in my head already. So, um, and by then I had a couple of things happen to me at work and I've been stuck by hypodermic needles by then and I had some bad events happen. So, um, no, I, I always was able to navigate and control my emotions. I was good at that. So I was self-taught in the beginning, mm -hmm. even when I worked. And then I was asked to go to DEA. And when I jumped to the DEA, uh, that's when I started doing more higher end narcotics work for them. Did you, did you have to use? as? No, as never, as never, as never, as never, never, never. Yeah, how, how did you avoid that? Um, well, my first major case, uh, it was a short term, every three months on the cover. And I had the guy walk in and he says, here's my samples. Here's the grade of product that you're going to buy mm -hmm. from me. So which one do you want to try first? Right. And it's all street. Uh, you know, why would I use in front of you? I'm, I'm here to make money. It's, right. We have ways of talking it out. And, um, but I didn't have the training back then. Then it was just me in the street. Right. And uh, in that particular one, I had an informant with me. And I was young, so thank God I had the informant because he kinda, we were in his house. And he kind of poo-pooed it away and right. said, you're not doing this in my house. So. Yeah. And then uh, and then you went to work for the DEA? I did, yeah. I worked in the DEA for a few years um, doing some work for them. I was working case work. I was in Haida, which is a high-intensity drug you know, trafficking uh, crew that we were in. We did a lot of stuff out of Mexico and just international drug trafficking and then some stuff in the street. And then I stuck my foot in the water there, started doing some undercover work for them. And, so. and when did the, tr did the transference to the mob take place? So... I guess when I when I smartened up in the DEA, 
there was a couple of incidents where it was touch and go and, and some things happened where I was like, you know, I don't want to, I can't do this anymore. By then I had been in my first marriage and I had a couple of kids and um, I cut my beard and shaved my head, you know, and I shaved it, but cut my hair and took the earrings out and I came to work looking like a, a federal agent looks. Right. And they were devastated. And uh, it was the next week that I started doing higher end drug deals. So I got into doing that and I said, you know, this kind of works for me. Just be yourself. Why do I have to pretend to be some other guy when I could just be me as you see me here? And it turns out bikers sleep on the ground under their bike. I didn't really like that too much. You know, <laughs> they don't eat at good restaurants. Yeah. So I realized, you know, this kind of works for me. And uh, <laughs> just be me. Just be myself. Yeah. And before you know it, I'm doing meetings in restaurants instead of McDonald's. You know, instead of meeting my, my targets in a Mickey D's, I'm meeting them in a, a nice restaurant in Atlantic right. City. So when I came to the FBI uh, and joined their task force, then they gave me, they provided me the training that I needed. So I went through their school. Which and, I, and, and the training for, uh, for, for undercover is an entirely different training than... Yeah, than totally different. Yeah, that's, a, that's something that uh, Joe Pistone had helped create, you know, after he, he did his thing and they stood up a school for training and, you know, without giving away too much of their secret sauce, it's not a pretty program to go through, you know. Uh, you have to have the stamina to do it. It's, uh, uh -huh. And how do you start? Okay, so now you get fully trained. Okay, you're, uh, you're undercover. They want you to go meet some mob guys. You know, how do you, how, do you start, how do you start that process? So I had a mentor when I first came into the Bureau, and we kind of matched up together. And uh, I talk about him in a book, Pino. And he was my mentor and taught me along the way and brought me into different cases to see how I could re see how I act, see if I'm a loose cannon and I'm just going to do crazy things or am I going to stay in my lane? And then that's where that Giovanni character, you know, was born because it's in me. Giovanni Gatto is me. It's important. It's just you got to pull him out a little bit and he'll come out. <laughs> and uh, one of the first ones was, uh, you know, a couple of deals we did. And it turns out I was the crazy kid in the corner, you know, if I needed to be. Right. I was the guy you didn't want to, you know, don't make my boss mad, you know, or something bad can happen uh -huh. to you without threatening. Because we can't threaten people, right, as, as, uh, as law enforcement. We're not allowed to do that. Right. But you give the impression. So all the, all the targets we did work with, whether it was Russian, Chinese, whatever organized crime we were doing at the time was, you know, they understood Giovanni Gatto's mentality. Okay. And, and by the way, because I, I haven't mentioned, all of these stories and plates are in his book, Giovanni's Ring, My Life Inside the Real Sopranos. Now, when you watch The Sopranos, you know, I mean, you'd watch these episodes. Uh, how true to life did you feel they were? How much of it you thought was just, you know, showbiz? Um, like everybody else, I watched The Sopranos before I did these cases. Um, when I lived it, it was very true to life. You know, the family aspect of what you saw, maybe not so much of the sporadic or just impulsive murders like every week on The Sopranos. Mm -hmm. But these guys were very capable. The family that I had, I had joined and infiltrated... Um, I did not intend to infiltrate the mob. This is not what I intended to do. I didn't just say, okay, let's do a mob case and I'll go in. I did a cameo in Atlantic City on a, on a drug buy. And during that drug buy, it just so happened the guys that were delivering were low-level associates. And when they showed up, I was genuinely mad. You know, I was genuinely, my wife was mad. It was Sunday night. I had to drop the kids the next day. It was my day to take the kids. And my wife said, look, you better, you better be here in the morning to take these kids. You know, don't mess around. So... Time drags out. We're sitting there for two hours waiting for these guys to show up. And I was genuinely ticked off. So when they showed up, I wasn't a very pleasant individual. So I stared at the Yankee game while they sat over here. And I just said, just shut up and do your thing. You know, and I just my persona being how I was. Right. They bit <laughs> and uh, and they apologized. And then somehow they got the impression that we were with Bruno Scarfo guys from Philly. But it wasn't the case. And they just created it. They painted a picture for themselves of who we were. You know, we right. never told them we were mob guys. Right. They just speculated. They just speculated. Yeah. And they ran with it because they thought we were serious guys. So it was just a drug case. We were going to slam dunk it and, you know, finish these guys off. And that was it. And then all of a sudden, I started dealing with them, with the drugs. And then it was, wow, you got to meet my buddy Louis. You know, Luigi, Luigi Oliveri. And uh, he was, at the time, was an associate in the family. And then as I met these guys, that's, it was one step and then another and another. And it just kind of morphed into itself. So it wasn't like we planned this whole thing out. I love to say we did, but we kind of didn't. It just, we let them guide us along the way. And then it became, Louie met me, and then Louie wanted me in his crew, and he wanted to do business. And then the kid that I was doing the narcotics deals with, Jimmy, he, want, he had his Uncle Charlie, who was just getting out of prison, who was a soldier in the family. And, you know, then he wanted to meet me. 
And then when I met him, then it was a tug of war. And it was moving up the ladder. Yeah. You, you know, this mob museum is full of stories of undercover um, um, informers, police officers, et cetera. You know, and it, it dates back to what, the 20s, the 30s, the 40s, the 50s. And here we are, 2020. Is this, is this still um, as significant an issue of police work do, going undercover as it was 20 years ago? Undercover work more so now than it ever was, I think. Uh, undercover work. The mob is always going to be here. You know, they're always going to be here and they're never going to go away. Um, but undercover work is more significant now. Because of electronics and the way we do things nowadays and the way we live our life, it's more hands, you know, more in person. Right. So it's, it's definitely something that will never, you know, it's always enhanced. And how the mob has done business, has that changed significantly with technology? Technology, no. How, how they traditionally do things. I mean, I did, I did the swag, the stolen goods. I kind of made my way in with that. Of course, right. with the narcotics, I made a, a name for myself in the street. But then I started providing. They provided for me, you know, which was historically the hijack stuff. The clothes, the shoes, the cigarettes, and all those things, and we were trading back and forth. So that's still that was going on in the '70s with the hijack loads. And then by the time I was running my own crew, they wanted to still hijack loads. But technology changed in a way, and I discuss it in the book that we had to be careful of what loads to hit, because now these these trailers have trackers in them. Right. You know, so, what encouraged you to write the book? I mean, you you, can't, you take you take a big chance writing the book. Huge, right? yeah. Hence the sunglasses and the, you know, um, you know. I, I did it for therapeutic reasons first, because a psychologist told me when I was being relocated to just get a notebook and just start writing things down. Well, can you talk about that before you get into the book? Let's mm -hmm. talk about the whole, the whole relocation idea. Mm -hmm. Well, the case came to an end. Obviously, I couldn't murder anybody right. like I was tasked to do. Uh, so when the case did come to an end and the arrest happened, they didn't know what to do with me. The close proximity and how I was doing business in the street, in that neighborhood, uh, and, and then out here, I was out here in Vegas all the time. And um, so from here to Vegas, it was something I couldn't do. I couldn't be around anymore. So uh, because of my close proximity, my family living in our, the same backyard as some of the guys in my the Cavacante family, uh, they assessed it and realized that I couldn't stay where we were and we need to be relocated. Is relocation the same as uh, witness protection? No, um, a little bit. You know, I was the first task force officer to be relocated. Mm -hmm. That's what really threw a lot of stuff into the game was because if I was just an FBI, they would have plucked me into another field office. But, you know, because of me as a TFO, I had to, you know, there was a whole logistics behind that. Right. So you change your name and mm -hmm. you, you try to keep a low profile. But, yeah. yeah. But, but writing a book is not exactly low profile. No, it's not yeah. low profile. And yeah. I, you know, it was a struggle, you know, when I decided to do it, but I wanted people to understand. I didn't, I didn't intend to in infiltrate the mafia. And, um, the toll it took on me and my family as well, because the family that I infiltrated was the crime family, but it was also these, um, this emotional roller coaster that I went on with infiltrating their family members, you know, being a part of their family. And it wasn't that I, those are the people I grew to have relationships with. Yeah, so, so like, would you like have uh, family events with your family and their family? No, never, no. never, never. Mm -hmm. So, they, but they, I'm sure they would call or come sure. by the they house. They knew I had a girlfriend. Yeah. They knew where I lived. Uh -huh. um, they never met my girlfriend. They never were at my house because I was a, a true gangster that said, you know, mm -hmm. there's no reason for you to come to the house. But yet I was in all of their houses. Well, not all their houses, but my captain, Charlie, you know, I would, I would be out here. He lived in Henderson at the time and I'd come out here to visit him. And he knew, I, he knew where I lived in New York. He knew I had a girlfriend. He knew I had a life. Um, so he, yeah, I gave him little snapshots and just to feed him something. Mm -hmm. So he had it. But it was the... Uh, the fact that I am a police officer and it was an assignment to me, it was just an assignment. It wasn't like I wanted to be a gangster. I didn't never aspire for that kid in the street. Right. I knew I never wanted to be that kid. I didn't want to be a criminal growing up. I didn't look at these guys with a fascination and a love for their what they did. It's just I knew the way. I knew the walk. I knew the talk. And I knew how to navigate these guys. It wasn't my first time infiltrating them. But, but still, you had to create a split personality in that regard, right? Sure. You had to be two people. Oh, I had multiple people. My yeah. wife actually had to build another closet in our master bedroom because <laughs> I had four different identities. <laughs> and each, and you know, it wasn't very nice because she had a nice closet, but then I needed a double closet <laughs> because depending on who I was, <laughs> yeah, and I had four different identities and yeah. depending on what case I was working. So, um, yeah, it, it takes its toll. But the reason behind the book was I wanted people to understand what the price my family paid, what I paid, but also the guys that are still doing this job, the girls that are still doing this kind of work that don't, they don't get the accolades. 
You know, they, they don't get to they don't get to be stood on a podium like law enforcement does. Law enforcement is not an easy job. It's a hard job. Uh, yeah, it's a very hard job. Mm-hmm. And of course, the uh, the worlds that you law enforcement travels in today are much more sophisticated than they ever were. And even with the different ethnicities and the different languages and the different countries, nationalities, in addition to the types of crimes. Yeah. And I, I think the different nationalities is what made it easy for me in other cases. Because everybody loves a good mobster. Everybody <laughs> wants to know a mobster. Everybody wants to say they're friends with a gangster. You know, a gangster's gangster. So when I had to infiltrate other um, organized crime families or, you know, other nationalities, it was easy for me. They bit. They bit all the time on... You know, one case I had infiltrated the Black Panthers as as Giovanni Gatto, you know, because it just made sense. So everybody wanted to be friends with a gangster. Well, what type of crimes were the was the mob into at that time? When I was in? It, yes. Um, traditional, they did the drugs, you know, like they always uh-huh. do. They say they're, you know, years ago they say they're against it, right. but they're all for it now because it's a money maker. Uh, stolen merchandise. Um, it could be anything. It could be stocks, you know, depending on... They're very, there are guys that are sophisticated. Mm-hmm. You know, even my captain, he was institutionalized. Charlie, the capo, he was very institutionalized, but he was very smart. Quick with numbers, quick brain, quick thinking, uh-huh. ran legitimate. As we called it when I was under, we call it the left and the right. Everything you do on the right is the, the good stuff. The businesses that we ran and the companies that we were into, but then the left when, you know, that was the, the bad stuff, the illegal stuff. So anything on the right, but... We would get into a business with a reason. If there was a construction company he wanted me to be in, he would put me there. But the ultimate goal was to squeeze this guy. How about the casino industry? Do you have any involvement with them? In not out here. Industry? No, not in no. the casinos. No. Mm-mm. No. No. He, he stayed away, I guess, because of licensing and the fact that, you know, here they're very careful. I got yelled at a couple of times for the hotels I stayed in out here, you know, because um, he knew. He knew we were on a radar. After a while, yeah. he knew coming out here to Vegas, you know, I got the schooling of, because I would do things purposely to spark a conversation. And he would right. say to me, Giovanni, what are you doing? You can't stay here because I bring my biker friends out here. Uh-huh. You know, ultimately, yeah. they were the, yeah. my, my best friend Dutch and, and the other guy who was ultimately uh-huh. who I used to do the murders or was going to. They would come out here and I put them up in a hotel with me. And he said, what are you doing? You can't stay here. You got Metro. You got this. You got that. You got the bulls are all over out here. You're on camera everywhere you go. Go downtown. Stay, put these guys downtown. It's like to push the envelope just to get a yeah. reaction. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because sometimes yeah. the reaction can open up another, another horizon for you. It could also be dangerous well, because sure. my guy was yeah. a hair trigger. He, he was a, uh, you know, he was a sociopath at times. You know, he was a murderer, a convicted murderer, and always reminding me, you know, I, I killed more people by accident, Giovanni. Well, was, it, was there a time where you can reflect back and th- think that this is the most dangerous moment I've ever had. Yeah, I put myself in some bad spots in this. In this case specifically, for the good of the case, I had gone above and beyond and put myself in some really hairy spots. I mean, two or three times, I'm lucky I walked away. Yeah. Um, and th- those stories are in the book, the stories when I almost got caught with the wire, you know, um, by his son. You know, um, the times that I was planning a murder and I wasn't moving fast enough on it. And if they decided to pull the murder back, well, I could wind up dead at any time. They still use wires or they have other, I mean, now, now, now I'll tell you, you can, you can catch, pick up frequencies yeah, 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 yeah. wearing a wire. Yeah, right? you can pick up anything, yeah. yeah right. like they have so many, so much sophistication, you know. Do you ever uh, work with, uh, with police departments or federal authorities now? Uh, well, I do now. I teach, you know, teach, I'll, yeah. I'll teach and I'll do some presentations and I'll teach some younger guys now, which is great because I have the training that the Bureau gave me, the training of my experience in my career, and I kind of share. That's why I was very raw in the book because I want people to know you make mistakes, you learn from your mistakes. Um, but yeah, I still do that. Now I'm involved in the mental health and behavioral health with law enforcement. Did you have the same kind of experience that your dad had? You know, your dad felt bad that he didn't spend the time that he should have with the family you know, because of his job. I mean, did you have those feelings? Oh, also? yeah, I have my haunts. Yeah. yeah, I have my haunts. I think I shared the story when, um, you know, my son had called me up and uh, for a fourth grade field trip. And I was operational that morning and it wasn't recent. It was years ago. And, you know, asking me where I am. And I'm like, what are you talking about? Like, where am I? I'm in work. What do you what do you need, buddy? And he tells me, like, we're waiting for you. The, the buses, the school bus is here waiting. You yeah. said you, you signed up to be a chaperone. You know, moments like that, not making the the, uh, the Christmas pageants or something. You know, and I write, a, I tell the story in the book when I, I did a drug deal and they were burning cocaine in the room that I was in. And I showed up at my son's Christmas pageant 
you know, cracked out of my mind because I was doing that drug deal. Mm -hmm. But realistically, I probably should have been in a hospital, but, you know, I needed to get to my son's. Mm -hmm. I tried to get to my son's pageant, you know. Yeah. And uh, that triggered my wife to, to think, you're so far gone, you know. Now she started to doubt me. Yeah. She was asking me, are you, are you doing drugs or what are you doing here, you know. And I had to explain to her what I was doing, you know, and exposure that I had was only minimal exposure, you know. I wasn't like a full-blown crack addict, but right. you, know, you still had exposure, so. Right, I mean, but there's things you could say and things you couldn't say, obviously. Right. Mm -hmm. As you walk through the mob museum here and you see all these um, notorious um, former gangsters, mob guys, associates, who do you feel is, was the most notorious of all of them? Notorious? Um, you, there's the Godfather himself, Lucky Luciano, was probably the most, because that's mm -hmm. what everybody aspires to be in that world. Um, I would say uh, Gas Pipe. Gas Pipe was one of the worst violent offenders. Uh, the Grim Reaper, Gregory Scarfo. You know, um, Scarpa is one of the most brutal guys. Those guys were mm -hmm. the scariest. The guys that can kill without, you know. I mean, I've met guys in my career undercover and even working cases that have literally bragged about eating dinner, stabbing a guy in the eye with a fork, wiping it off, and then going back to eating. I mean, that's a whole nother level of crazy. Yeah, and when you look at some of these, um, um, some of these groups, whether it be the Colombians, the, the Italians, the Russians, the Israelis, I mean, who is, who, who is the most dangerous of those kind of organized crime groups? The Sicarios right now down in Mexico. Yeah, really? the Coyotes and the yeah. Sicarios, yeah. And I came up, when I came, when I started, Colombians ran the show. Right. Um, and Colombians are great to do business. You know, you had a Colombian trafficker, uh, they would wear a white collared shirt. You know, they'd put a collared shirt on the day that the deal was going to come. Uh -huh. And if they were in a T-shirt, you knew they didn't have You knew they didn't have your dope, you know, because uh -huh. they were true businessmen. Very reliable mm -hmm. in that regard. Mm -hmm. And then uh, as the Mexican cartels came to, to the surface, they are the most, by far the most violent that I, I think. We got about 30 seconds left. Uh, so after reading the book, what is it that you want your readers to take with them? Uh, just a story of what people sacrifice, you know, just myself, my sacrifice, my family sacrifice, and just the sacrifice that law enforcement is doing on a daily basis. I'm one of tens of thousands of guys doing this kind of job. You can catch this on Amazon, right? Amazon, Barnes yeah. & Noble, any major book. Yeah, yeah, and it's, look, I don't know why, I don't know why anybody wants to do this anymore. It's a dangerous <laughs> job, but, but thank you for yeah, doing thank it. Thank you, and thanks for having me. I really okay. appreciate it. Thank you, Giovanni. Thank you.